my name is Ian Sharp. I'm a consultant uh, orthopaedic surgeon in Exeter, and I'll be covering pilon and hind foot fractures. Uh, in this talk, we will cover uh, pilon fractures and their management, talus fractures, and calcaneal fractures. So what do these fractures have in common? Well, they are devastating injuries, and we often counsel patients when we first see them uh, that they have a severe injury and the rehabilitation process is going to take an extended period of time. We have to recognise that they are soft tissue injuries as well as bony injuries and the associated fracture is often complex. The reduction and immobilisation techniques employed to treat these fractures are challenging the blood supply and access to the fractures are crucial and an understanding of these will uh, improve the surgical outcomes. We also have to be aware that associated injuries are extremely common as these fractures are usually associated with high energy uh, mechanisms of injury. A recurring theme uh, throughout this uh, talk will be the management of the soft tissues associated with the fracture. We need to appreciate uh, swelling reduction, which may employ elevation, splintage, and can involve the use of vac dressings. We need to consider stabilization of the lower limb uh, using external fixators to aid in the soft tissue management. We may need to involve the use of uh, plastic surgeons if a skin has been compromised or the injury is open. The fracture fixations we're going to discuss uh, are aimed at providing a stable and adequate reduction to allow for anatomic uh, reduction of the fracture pattern and to there therefore allow for uh, adequate rehabilitation and trying to give the best outcome possible. As with any fracture, the management of the bone is aimed at reducing the fracture, immobilizing the fracture, and then allowing for physiotherapy and rehabilitation to be undertaken. In this first section, we will discuss uh, pilon fractures and look at uh, the description of the fracture and the mechanism of injury, discuss specific x-rays and imaging studies, discuss some classifications of the fracture patterns and management strategies for the initial management of the injury and more definitive management. We will then review the outcomes of uh, these management strategies. Once again, though it is a recurrent theme, we must remember the pilon fracture represents a soft tissue injury with an associated fracture. And the initial management uh, of the injury should recognize this fact. A pilon fracture occurs uh, when the talus is driven into the tibial plafond and causes disruption to the joint surfaces and the uh, distal tibia. It is often uh, thought of as the tail has been driven into the tibial plafond, such as a pestle and mortar, uh, hence the description pilon. Initial imaging is uh, plain radiographs. These are useful as a baseline investigation to give a overall view of the injury pattern, joint disruption and joint dislocations. These can be useful pre and post application of external fixator. However, the definitive imaging should be an actual CT scan. Uh, Paul Tornetta in 1996 uh, produced a seminal paper where he compared plain radiographs of penal fractures with CT scans. The uh, CT scan revealed an increased number of fragments 
and impaction in over 80% of the patients. They then reviewed the uh, outcomes using the CT scan and noted the operative plan changed in over 64% of the patients. Uh, in the modern trauma meeting, we should all be aiming to obtain CT scans of penile fractures, as this helps with the planning of the fixation, planning of the uh, incisions required to fix the fracture, and also gives an overall impression of the potential uh, pitfalls of fixation. Classifications of pilon fracture are many and varied. Uh, the Rudy and Algauer classification is the most widely known, but the most useful classification is that uh, developed by Topless and the team in Bristol, published in 2005. The Rudy and Algauer classification uh, is a simple classification which defines a fracture as one, which is undisplaced and relatively anatomically reduced, two, a displaced fracture, and three, a smashed tibial plafond. This classification has limited use, but does convey uh, the severity of the injury. Uh, Claire Topless and the team in Bristol reviewed a, whole, a series of CT scans of pion fractures and were able to classify them into two families, those with coronal fracture lines and those with sagittal fracture lines. Once these uh, have been defined, it helps with the planning of the surgical approach and fixation, which we'll discuss later. The uh, classification can be taken further and it was noted there are six common fragments in pilon fractures, with an anterior and anterolateral fragments noted, a large posterior fragment often noted, a posterolateral fragment, a medial fragment, and a die punch fragment. When reconstructing these the fractures, uh, the surgical approach can be planned to allow best access to the fracture plane. The initial management of the pilon fracture should be along ATLS type guidelines, uh, taking note of any associated injuries. The pain should be controlled with the splintage and appropriate analgesia. A full neurovascular assessment should be made together with an assessment of the skin condition, any open injuries and any uh, skin under threat. Uh, appropriate splintage should be applied, photographs taken of any open injuries and appropriate dressings put in place. Plain radiographs should be organised and uh, appropriate uh, senior uh, colleagues made aware of the injury uh, to plan further management. The early management of penile fractures is uh, around stabilisation of the injury and this is achieved by an external fixator. We can then span the injury, allow the soft tissues to rest scan the injury which allows planning to allow the appropriate surgeon to do an operation at the appropriate time with stable soft tissues. A standard external fixator can be applied in an A-frame type construct which gives a stable fixation. It can be useful to have a bone model in the trauma theatre to represent how an external fixator should be applied, which allows any team to apply one uh, on call. The stable A-frame construct allows uh, reliable access to the uh, skin to assess for soft tissue problems and allow for soft tissue resuscitation. This makes the limb safe to allow you for scanning and planning in a controlled time scale. The management of the injury can then be planned 
and a stage protocol used for soft tissue management. In certain situations, an external exfictator may be the definitive treatment, although this is rare. The CT scan once obtained allows for a guided approach and the uh, fracture may be fixed using minimally invasive fixation or lock in place depending upon local practice. However, the principles of the definitive management remain the same. The first objective is to uh, achieve articular reconstruction. Once the joint surfaces have been reconstructed, the articular block can be connected to the metaphysis. The construct can then be stabilized and the, the limb uh, mobilized. The principles involved in the articular reconstruction and surgery should involve minimal dissection, generous fasciocutaneous windows, minimal soft tissue stripping and metal work to provide stability. The articular reconstruction is planned using the CT scan. The planning is achieved using the lowest axial slice and fluoroscopically assisted surgery. Knowing the fracture pattern and the cleavage lines allow for planning of the approach with a direct approach to the fracture. Percutaneous screws can then be used uh, to reduce the fracture and hold it. The less invasive the approach, the more planning is often required. In this situation here, we can see uh, that the soft tissues have been rested. Whilst there is bruising, the swelling is reduced. The principles of reconstruction involve um, careful uh, soft tissue dissection with minimal soft tissue stripping. The articular segments uh, can be reconstructed and then the articular block fixed to metaphysis uh, either using plate fixation or as in this situation a Taylor spatial frame. Here the uh, joint surface is intact uh, and the articular block has been uh, fixed to the tibial shaft uh, using a percutaneous uh, plate fixation with the assistance of an external fixator. There are many papers in the literature on the outcome of uh, peel on fractures. The worse the injury, the worse the outcome. The papers indicate that 83% uh, will have poor results if managed conservatively. However, against this is that there are some papers which indicate a 50% infection risk within the open approach. The papers would suggest the newer methods of uh, fixation uh, have better results than a uniaxial external fixator. And the use of Taylor spatial frame gives comparable outcomes to single stage fixation. The general feeling is that a staged fixation offers advantages over single staged uh, RF. The outcomes are also dependent upon uh, the mechanisms of injury and the energy involved. Patient factors play a large part uh, with smoking, diabetes and other systemic uh, features note, uh, contributing heavily to the final outcome. Surgeon factors are also important, uh, depend upon the ability, the experience and available equipment. However, we must recognise these injuries are uh, high energy devastating injuries and in certain situations the outcome is going to be poor, however good the surgery has been. To recap the main learning points on pilon fractures, we must recognise that these are potentially limb threatening injuries. There's been often been a high energy transfer and we must recognise that this is a soft tissue injury to the lower limb containing a fracture.
The soft tissues must be stabilized uh, with an external fixator type construct, which allows for CT scan to allow for planning of the final surgery. We must recognize that once the soft tissues have been stabilized, we have time to plan the surgery and it is often useful to use the topless classification to define the surgical approach. Throughout the surgical approach, one must recall, uh, recognize uh, and respect the soft tissues, respect the soft tissues and further respect the soft tissues. We now move on to the discussion around talus fractures. Once again, we shall run through description of Taylor fractures, specific radiographs and imaging studies available, a classification system for uh, Taylor fractures, and a management protocol for the initial management and definitive management, combined with a brief review of outcomes. The Talus uh, is a inherently stable uh, bone which has 60% articular cartilage covering its surface. It has poorly perforating uh, vasculature and has seven articulations. We can classify uh, the fracture groups into peripheral fractures, body fractures and tail and neck fractures. The peripheral fractures are uncommon uh, but should not be missed. The posterior process fractures uh, have uh, names of Sedell's fracture with a fracture of the medial part of the posterior process and Shepherd's fracture with a fracture from the lateral side. The lateral process fracture is often known as a snowboard's fracture and you must not forget acute osteochondral type of fractures. Uh, the management of the lateral process fracture it depends upon the size of the fragment and degree of comminution. They can either be fixed in place or removed or if minimally displaced, can be managed conservatively. Acute osteochondral fractures uh, may be fixed with arthroscopic assistance and barbizorbable pin fixation. Posterior fractures are uncommon and can often be managed conservatively, although there are options available to fix or remove them. Taylor body and neck fractures are severe injuries. 30% are known to be open and are uh, high energy injuries, often associated with uh, degloving and skin sloughing. We must be aware of associated injuries and lower limb uh, type compartment syndrome. Initial radiographs should be undertaken uh, of the foot and of the ankle. Uh, specialised view, views are available, uh, such as the Canale and Kelly view, which uh, allows for visualisation of the tail and neck. The most useful imaging modality for tail fractures is the CT scan. We know from studies from Seattle uh, that uh, fractures of up to two millimeter displacement are not uh, visualized on plane radiographs and therefore a CT scan is required uh, to confirm the nature of uh, tail and neck and body fractures. The vascular supply of the talus is tenuous and must be appreciated uh, when assessing the injury uh, 
and planning for further surgery. Uh, the deltoid branch uh, from the posterior tibial artery uh, supplies the tarsal head. Uh, there is a tarsal sinus artery coming from the perineal artery and there are branches to the neck of the talus coming off the anterior tibular artery. Hawkins classified uh, tail and neck fractures in the 1970s you, based upon plane radiographs. A Hawkins 1 type injury was uh, felt to be an undisplaced vertical neck fracture, although these days we are aware there is often displacement on CT scan. The fracture line enters the subtalar joint between the medial and posterior facets. There is no associated subluxation of the ankle or the subtalar joint and uh, the only blood supply that is disrupted is via the neck. This produces an AVN risk of around 10%. Hawkins 2 represents displaced vertical neck fracture with uh, subluxation or dislocation of the subtalar joint. The ankle joint remains normal. This fracture pattern causes injury to the arteries of the tarsal sling and on the dorsal neck. Uh, the AVN risk of this injury is in the region of 40%. Hawkins 3 injury represents a displaced vertical neck fracture. The body of the talus is dislocated from the ankle and the subtalar joints. This results in all the blood supply being disrupted and AVN approaches 90% risk. Hawkins 4 classification was added in 1978 by Canale. He described a displaced vertical neck fracture, the talar body dislocated from the ankle and subtalar joints, combined with dislocation or subluxation of the head of the talus. This injury pattern disrupts the whole of the blood supply to the talus and produces an AVN risk approaching 100%. The initial management of a talar neck or body fracture again involves an assessment of the soft tissues. Uh, soft tissue, damp, soft tissue uh, injury is not as uh, problematic as a pilon fracture, but in certain situations there can be skin compromise medially or laterally. In this situation, the soft tissue should be stabilised with an external fixator and some attempt made to reduce the pressure on the skin. Once again, uh, the aim is to obtain uh, CT scans to lay planning for surgical intervention. There is uh, no evidence, there is no improvement in the rate of AVN with the early intervention. The main objective should be to provide the correct surgeon at the correct time with the correct surgery, respecting the soft tissues for fixation of the fracture. The aim is to restore the articular anatomy. Once the anatomy is restored, the hope is this will enhance revascularization and decrease the risk of avascular necrosis. And the base of the third metatarsal. This is lateral to the extensor tendons and avoids the dorsalis pedis artery. However, uh, the artery of the tarsal sling uh, can be uh, disrupted by this approach and there are concerns over blood supply using this approach. An alternative uh, approach is to perform a fibular osteotomy which allows a good visualisation of the Taylor body. This approach is rarely utilised. Uh, the medial approach uh, 
should be between tibialis anterior and tibialis posterior. This approach is extensile in nature and can be extended to lay for a medial malolar osteotomy, which may be necessary uh, for accurate visualization of tailor body fractures and extensive tailor neck fractures. When using these approaches, one must be aware of the uh, deltoid uh, branch uh, artery, which provides uh, blood supply to the tailor body. The medial approach allows for visualization of the tailor neck, correct identification of the fracture, and a proper appreciation of the comminution, which tends to be medial. If the medial approach is not utilized, it is possible to malreduce the fracture. The medial malolar osteotomy is a useful technique to allow for accurate visualization of the body of the talus. This maintains the deltoid vessels and blood supply to the tailor body. In using combined approaches, this allows through the medial side for accurate visualization of the reduction and through the lateral approach allows for view of the subtalar joint. This allows for the, any loose fragments to be excised, accurate reduction, an appreciation of rotation and accurate fixation. As indicated here, uh, there are uh, several options for fixation, including uh, plates that lie within the sinus tarsi and lay for accurate fixation of tailor neck fractures. Concerns over using uh, the two incision approach are of uh, soft tissue stripping and of concerns over the skin bridge, which lies between the two incisions. Biomechanical studies show that uh, screws from the anterior approach have less biomechanical stability than those from the posterior approach. In view of this, uh, several centers have developed the use of the posterior limb of the Eastwood Atkins approach uh, to allow for visualization of Taylor fractures. This avoids disruption of the remaining blood supply and can allow for placement of screws in the posterior to anterior alignment, giving more uh, stable fixation. These images here indicate visualization of a posturolaterally extruded uh, Taylor body using the vertical limb of the Eastwood Atkins approach. Posterolateral fixation uh, is difficult. There is limited non-articular surface available for the introduction of screws. However, the fixation achieved is biomechanically more stable, but can lead to problems with metalwork removal. When reviewing the surgical approaches for Taylor fractures, we can see that the anteromedial approach allows for an accurate reduction and avoidance of uh, malreduction. However, there is no view obtained of the subtalar joint. Fixation is adequate and with careful dissection, the vascular supply is preserved. The anterolateral approach allows for uh, an adequate reduction, a view of the subtalar joint, adequate fixation, but further disruption to the already tenuous blood supply. The posterior approach does not allow for any assessment of reduction. Some of the subtalar joint can be visualized. Fixation is superior and the vascular supply is preserved. Therefore, in most situations, a combination of approaches is recommended to obtain for accurate reduction stable fixation
and preservation of the vascular supply. Postoperative management of the uh, fracture often involves a period of non-weight bearing, either in a plaster cast or a uh, postoperative boot. We hope to see a Hawking sign, which indicates revascularization of the uh, Taylor body. AVN is always of concern and careful monitoring of the progress of the patient is required uh, with long term follow up. There is limited evidence uh, for extended periods of non weight bearing beyond six weeks in the management of avascular necrosis and it is often more beneficial to obtain movement in the ankle and subtalar joints uh, with uh, physiotherapy. Outcomes have been reviewed uh, for Taylor fractures and it is noted that AVN approaches 25% in most series. Non-union is rare and the most common problem is of uh, malunion, often into varus due to a failure to appreciate the comminution of the medial side of the tailor neck, which can be avoided using a medial approach. Tem segmental AVN is often well tolerated. Stiffness is often present following Taylor uh, fractures, uh, which can be addressed with arthroscopy, debridement, and potentially fusion if required. In summary, uh, Taylor fractures often involve high energy injuries. Soft tissue and vascular compromise needs to be appreciated. When reconstructing uh, the Taylor fracture, one must pay careful attention to medial neck comminution. Anatomic reduction uh, is the aim of surgery. And this may require a combination of surgical approaches to allow for adequate visualization and fixation. During any surgical approach, we need to be careful to minimize any further vascular insult. Patients need to be counseled from an early stage of the severity of a Taylor fracture and the possibility of a vascular necrosis or subsequent development of arthritic changes. The final portion of this presentation is on calcaneal fractures. We will cover a description of the fracture patterns, specific imaging studies required, classification systems, initial and definitive management, and an assessment of outcomes. The uh, calcaneum can be thought of as an irregular rectangle with six surfaces. There are four articulations, three with a talus and one with the cuboid. Uh, extra articular fractures include anterior process fractures, which may represent avulsion injuries or compression injuries involving the calcaneal cuboid joint. These may require excision or fixation, but often can be managed conservatively. Tuberosity fractures are uh, difficult to manage, sometimes leading to uh, pressure necrosis over the posterior skin. Fixation techniques are difficult due to the uh, forces applied to the bony fragments and often poor quality of the bone. A variety of techniques are used, often requiring uh, 
screw fixation combined with some form of tension band wiring. Sestantacidum tail eye fractures in isolation are uncommon, uh, but can be fixed from a careful medial approach. The main uh, area of discussion in this presentation is of intra-articular fractures. We can think of three lines of fracture cleavage. The primary fracture line results in an oblique shear and leads to the following two primary fragments. There's a supramedial fragment, which is often referred to as the constant fragment, which includes the sustentaculum tali and is stabilized by strong ligamentous and capsular attachments. The supralateral fragment includes an intra-articular aspect through the posterior facet. Secondary fracture lines can occur in the sagittal plane and the coronal plane. These can give anteromedial fragments, the sestentacular fragment, a lateral joint fragment, anterolateral fragments and body fragments. In order to assess uh, the calcaneal fracture, plane films are the first imaging study obtained. We recommend obtaining ankle and foot x-rays to allow for accurate assessment of the position of the fracture fragments and its relation to the remains of the foot and of the ankle. The classical angles measured are bowler's angle which is the angle between a line from the highest point of the anterior process to the highest point of the posterior facet and a line tangential to the superior edge of the tuberosity. This is measured on the lateral view and should normally be between 20 to 40 degrees. Gisane's angle represents a line along the lateral margin of the posterior facet and a line from the anterior to beaker calcaneus measured on the lateral view. This should be between 120 145 degrees. These angles give representation of the degree of flattening and disruption to the posterior facet and anatomy of the calcaneum. Further planeful imaging can be the Broden view, which gives you a view of the posterior facet. This is more useful in the uh, operating room for assessment of reduction of the facet. Further views of the AP and axial views uh, can demonstrate the subtalar joint and degree of uh, varus valgus and sustentacular reduction. And these are often more useful in the operating environment. CT scanning has uh, revolutionized the uh, assessment of calcaneal fractures. The best way to obtain the optimal scan is to have the patient supine with hips and knees flexed with the feet flat on the table. The gantry is positioned so the cuts are perpendicular to the posterior facet and three millimeter cuts are utilized. The hips and knees are then extended uh, for transverse uh, and axial cuts. This gives two views at 90 degrees and allows for accurate assessment of the fracture pattern. Uh, the coronal view uh, gives visualization of the sustentaculum tali, the sinus tarsi and the posterior facet. This view allows for accurate uh, classification and operative uh, planning. Classification systems exist for uh, calcaneal fractures. Essex Lepresti uh, described a central joint depression type fracture and tongue type fractures.
Sanders developed a classification system based on along the coronal CT imaging, which is most commonly used uh, these days. Essex Leprestes description was in 1952, where they described uh, a tongue type injury or a joint depression type injury. Sanders developed a classification system in 1992 using CT scans. This is based upon the number of articular fragments seen on the coronal CT image at the widest points of the articular facet. This is helpful in a description of how severe the injury is and in some situations can help with operative planning. Uh, Eastwood and Atkins described three patterns of injury looking at the position of the lateral joint fragment to help in uh, planning an operative approach. Uh, the management of calcaneal fractures uh, is based upon the history and associated injuries. The mechanism of injury is often high energy and one must therefore apply ATLS type principles in resuscitation of the patient. Once the patient has been stabilised, examination can be made of the soft tissues around a calcaneum. Radiographs can be organised, followed by CT scans in the axial and semicoronal plane to allow for accurate planning of surgical possible surgical. There remains controversy over which calcaneal fractures should be fixed. The National Heal Fracture Study, published in BMJ, attempted to address some of these areas of controversy. The findings indicated that the majority of calcaneal fractures could be managed conservatively with reasonable outcomes. However, there are certain fracture patterns which result in continued disability post-fracture where there has been considerable blowout of the lateral, fibula, the lateral wall of the calcaneum. This can lead to fibular impingement and pain. Where there's been significant subtalar joint derangement and uh, alteration of anatomy, this can lead to altered hind foot biomechanics with valgus and varus deformity, altered length and altered calcaneal pitch. In this situation, uh, the aim of surgery is to reduce the lateral wall to prevent fibula and perineal impingement, to improve the hind foot biomechanics, to allow for early mobilization and the restoration of the posterior facet and a calcaneal cuboid joint. Reduction of the anterior calcaneum to unblock the subtalar joint can also be achieved. Current surgical practice <clears throat> is based upon um, AO techniques of internal fixation. CT scanning has revolutionized the understanding of the fracture anatomy and the most popularized approach involves the extended lateral approach uh, developed in Bristol by Eastwood and Atkins. This involves an extended lateral approach, which is based upon the angiosomes in the area. The approach begins in the midline posteriorly, seven centimeters proximal to the tip of the fibula. It passes distally and slightly anteriorly, so that at the level of the tip of the fibula, it lies just in front of the Achilles tendon. At the point of the heel, it turns 90 degrees and passes forward on the lateral border of the heel as far as the base of the fifth metatarsal. In its distal limb, the incision lies below the line of demarcation between the bruised area around the lateral hind foot and the unbruised skin on the sole of the foot. With the use of this approach, there is a decrease in wound complications and wound problems uh, when used for open reduction internal fixation of calcaneal uh, fractures.
the surgical approach relies upon uh, elevation of the lateral wall and reconstitution of the posterior facet. Fixation is uh, to the constant fragment or the sustentaculum tali fragment. A variety of techniques can be employed through the lateral approach using a variety of hooks and reduction tools. The controversy is because open reduction traditionally had high rates of serious soft tissue complications and infection. However, with the use of the Eastwood-Atkins approach, uh, these complications have reduced considerably full stop. Operative treatment has been uh, reviewed in a few studies with large numbers and good follow-up. The overall outcome of these studies is that operative treatment on the whole holds no benefit over non-operative treatment, with the remaining concerns over infection and complication rates. However, there are undoubtedly some fractures that do need reducing, and patients who have had operations uh, have better uh, outcomes and the outcome of any future surgery in the operator group is better than those managed conservatively initially. And the fracture demonstrated here, we can see how displaced the lateral wall of the calcaneum is, giving pressure upon the fibula and compressing the perineal uh, tendons. If this fracture is left unreduced, the outcome would be poor and the revision surgery complex. In this situation, there is merit in uh, initial surgical management. However, with a minimally displaced posterior facet, the majority of surgeons in the United Kingdom would manage the fracture conservatively. As can be seen from these post-operative films, with early intervention, this patient's biomechanics have been restored with uh, normal uh, hind foot alignment and good foot pressures. There has been considerable work uh, performed uh, using minimally invasive surgery with either percutaneous reduction of fractures and fixation with screws and there are very successful uh, series using arthroscopically assisted fixation of calcaneal fractures, which uh, avoids the risks of soft tissue problems. There are some papers uh, showing uh, good outcomes for uh, percutaneous fixation of fractures. So the gut feeling is that over time, the general feeling is that fractures should be reduced to restore anatomy, to stabilize the joint and allow early mobility. This uh, philosophy has been applied to every other joint fracture in the body. And therefore, in certain situations, calcaneal fractures should have the same rules applied to allow for better overall outcomes for patients. So in summary, uh, peel on fractures are a soft tissue injury with a fracture underlying it. CT scans are required for effective surgical decision making and surgery should be undertaken once the soft tissues allow for safe surgery. When appreciating talus fractures, one must be aware of the blood supply of the talus, aware of uh, the fracture patterns and the variety of surgical approaches employed to allow for accurate reduction and fixation. With calcaneal fractures, one must be aware of uh, the CT imaging studies required, understand the anatomy and the considerations for surgery versus conservative management of these fractures.